トビデオ Well, my freaky friends, it's October. Halloween is now upon us like an unstatable werewolf girlfriend, and as the celebratory drool, among other fluids, drips down on us this joyous autumn holiday, why not preoccupy ourselves by talking about something really scary? The direct video market of the 1980s. <laughs> Yeah, I bet this is something I haven't banged on about in a while. We all know the deal. Combination of the bubble economy and the advent of home video technology made for the ripe and diverse witch's brew that we now know of as the OVA era. And one of the many genres that really had their time in the sun in this period was horror. Hell, the horror genre in and of itself was having a boom in 1980s Japan with the amount of slashers imported from the states that was hitting the theaters. So of course, anime had to be made to keep up with that demand. The only problem is that a lot of these horror OVA titles were not exactly the most cinematic looking of the lot. They were usually the result of some studio slapping together 30 to 50 minutes of animated sex and or violence to appeal to the greasy masses that invested themselves into this media. But despite the obvious cut rate nature of these forgotten video nasties that I've covered over the years, I can usually find something I like about them. A title like Call Me Tonight had all the markings of some cheap exploitation film, but it ended up being a pretty solid midnight monster movie with some sex-positive themes surrounding it. And The Curse of Kazuo Umez ended up channeling the chilling look and feel of the eponymous author's manga work on screen in a way that almost overcomes the animation's limitations. So I think regardless of how cheap a direct-to-video horror anime looks, I can at least find some praiseworthy things about them. Which is too bad for today's anime because it will be getting none of it. Hiyoi and Ryoi Kagezaki are two brothers who share a strange power and an even stranger mission. The former is the ability to shapeshift into cats, a technique taught to them by their evil master Jukokubo. While their master originally taught them everything that he knew so that they could become servants of evil, the two brothers instead rebelled against their sensei and chose to use their power to fight on the side of good. Disappearing and lurking under the shadows of evil, that's the destiny of the dark cats. You enjoy cultivating the evil spirit in humans for your own selfish desire. But now, your reign of terror is over and the pupil is now the master. This leads into the latter. Their mission is to travel across Japan to contain any and all outbreaks of evil energy that lurks in the hearts of all mankind, an energy Jukokubu seeks to exploit for his own gain. But not if the two dark cats have anything to say about it. Dark Cats Unite! It's always a special occasion when I get to talk about an OVA like 1991's Dark Cats. Most of the anime I cover, while bearing some of the marks of the direct-to-video trade, still manage to shine like diamonds in the rough of the best of days. But on occasion, we gotta man up and take a sip of the garbage water. The absolute darkest and dankest pits of the OVA era, and among the wounded mans and the swords for truce, lies Dark Cats. And what it lacks in the exploitive qualities of the other two, it more than makes up for it in sheer artlessness. Everything about this reeks of just get it on the shelves as quickly as possible. It's animation, it's script, it's localization, just another product for the assembly line. But if you think I'm going to be devoting this entire video to just shitting on this anime, guess again. Anime this crappy deserves to have some context put behind it. That's what makes the history of learning about these titles so much fun. Plus, the story behind them is usually way more interesting than the anime itself. So let's kick off October right. Let us examine this dark cat on the veterinary table of analysis before we give it its critical neutering. Let's get up now there's fortuitous timing when indulging in this subject because before we even talk about dark cat on this month of Halloween, we need to talk about monthly Halloween. I mentioned at the top that the horror genre was incredibly popular in Japan during the 80s, but the demographic that was mostly going out to see the imported horror movies from America like Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street were mostly young women. Publisher Asahi Sonorama took notice of this trend. They had primarily been a publisher of shonen manga in the early 80s, but soon found the market to be way too competitive. Therefore, they pivoted to shoujo, which was a less crowded market post its golden age. 
Noticing the trend of young girls enjoying slasher films on top of the recent introduction of Halloween as a holiday of revelry in the country, Asahi Sonorama decided to create a monthly shoujo manga magazine devoted entirely to shoujo horror, Monthly Halloween. Shoujo horror had been a thing for a while, as I said back in my Bride of Deimos video, but there was never a dedicated magazine just for shoujo horror up until that point. And to really show that they were on the cutting edge, a lot of Halloween's first issues had manga adaptations of those same American-made horror movies teenage girls couldn't get enough of, from Nightmare on Elm Street, to Return of the Living Dead, to The Reanimator. They're frankly worth checking out if you want to see 80s horror classics rendered in the year 24 group style. Halloween still needed a dedicated talent pool though, so Asahi Sonorama contacted Master of Horror slash Where's Waldo impersonator Kazuo Umezu to participate in the launch of the magazine. To this end, they created the Kazuo Umez Prize to scout out talent. One such talent was a dentist assistant who had been wanting to break into the manga industry for quite some time. He submitted one of his stories to the contest and ended up winning. That story ended up becoming Halloween's flagship series. Tomie, written and drawn by one Junji Ito. Yep, Halloween was the magazine that got the most globally recognized horror mangaka his big break. Halloween only lasted 10 years, thanks to certain news events drying up the Japanese public's appetite for horror in the mid-90s. But still, its impact on shoujo horror is very important. It inspired scores of imitators who wanted to get in on the shoujo horror racket, and provided a platform for other aspiring horror authors, not just future legends like Ito. One of these authors was Naomi Kimura. He's one of those manga authors who has a vast body of work, but is only really known in his home country thanks to that bibliography being mostly untranslated. But one of the stories he did write, and is most well known for, was called Dark Cats. Running in Halloween for 10 volumes from July 20th, 1988 to February 20th, 1993, the plot is basically the same as what I stated before. And like most horror manga stories, it's structured episodically, having the two cat brothers traveling around Japan and fighting off the evil demons that feed off the evil in people's hearts. It seemed like it did well enough, sticking around in Halloween for most of its run, so it was definitely primed for at least one anime. Unfortunately, as we've seen so many times on this show, Jojo always got the short end of the stick when it came to OVAs. The world we're getting a Bride of Deimos was the best case scenario, and unfortunately for Dark Cat, it got the shortest end of the stick by falling into some really wrong hands. Nikasa Corporation was, and still technically is, the oldest and most storied film studio in Japan at the time, having been around ever since the dawn of movie making made it over to Japan. We've talked about them briefly in our Ayane's High Kick video, but they produced that when they were fighting off bankruptcy. They were in a far worse situation when they produced Dark Cats. After a golden age in the 50s and 60s where they produced some of Japan's finest non-Kurosawa helmed cinema, Nikatsu mostly pivoted in the 70s to become a studio that primarily produced pink films, movies that sold themselves on their liberal sex and violence and the combination of the two. In the 70s, those films were the classier brand of exploitation cinema, the kind that you could take home to Tarantino. In the 80s, however, they were producing absolute dreck. Look at their filmography and you realize that they were nothing more than a glorified porno studio in that decade. Hard times indeed, no pun intended. And it wasn't this time where they started to get involved with animation. In 1986, they had produced the obscure 80s sci-fi hentai Battle Kankan Can, just to give you a glimpse of what the typical 80s Nikatsu film was like. Can't show much of it for obvious reasons, but I will say that a lightsaber vibrator is involved. You can see why an obviously past its prime studio like Nikatsu getting the rights to produce an anime adaptation of a shoujo horror like Dark Hat doesn't inspire confidence. Yes, give this property to the makers of Lolita Vibrator Torture, please. Okay, in the interest of fairness, it did look like Nikatsu did try to hire actual industry folks to make this anime. You had Iku Suzuki as director, who had made his bread on directing several Urusei Yatsura episodes. For character designer, you had Masami Suda, who did the memorable character designs for the Fist of the North Star anime. And for screenwriter, you had... T T Toshiki Inoue? What? THE Toshiki Inoue? Legendary common writer screenwriter Toshiki Inoue? What? 
but it doesn't even really matter how talented this team was because it's so obvious that they are all resting on their laurels for this anime. On both a technical and story level, there is just no artistic passion whatsoever. Everybody on the staff was just working for that paycheck. But you know me, going against what I said in the intro, I gotta name some positives, and by gum, I did find a few. Like, while the monster designs of the evil spirits look a little too generically body horror, the way they are animated gives them a nice ickiness to them. And in spite of the production company's unsavory output at the time, there is a remarkable restraint in keeping these phallic looking tendrils to themselves. Even the bits of nudity are clearly not for titillation. And that's it. That's all the half-hearted praise I can give this anime because if I give any more, I would just be lying my head off. If you want to know what completely half-assing an anime looks like, Dark Hat is the answer. It is the most basic anime ever to be made without a shred of care to be had in nearly all avenues. Aside from those creepy tentacles, the animation is rudimentary, no extra flair whatsoever, just characters being animated from one stiff key pose to the next. But that's not too much of a deal breaker. Good direction can often be the refuge for anime that has neither the time nor the budget to pull off anything spectacular. Dark Cat has none of that. The direction and boarding is lifeless and uninspired. At least half the anime is just characters flatly standing next to each other and talking with no attempt to build a spooky atmosphere. So when the scares do begin to pop off, they come out of nowhere because there was no attempt to build tension. And when the scenes are not dull as a secondhand butter knife, they are incomprehensible. There is no flow or rhythm in how the action is cut, making important climaxes like the final fight with Juku Kubo a litter box sized mess. This uninspiredness extends to the art direction. The settings are nondescript stock high school environments with no undercurrent of darkness that would actually make this an effective horror feature. As far as anyone is concerned, the dark cats could be anywhere and not in their own anime. This artlessness extends to the localization which was done by Media Blasters. And it's funny how, even though they broke off from Central Park Media, they retained some of their worst habits. Haphazard voice direction, wooden line deliveries, and needlessly aggressive script rewrites. Hey faggot, what's up? This dub turns Dark Cat from a gauche anime to an incompetent one. People who complain about otherwise competent Funimation dubs have no idea how bad it was in the old days. Every decision made by voice director T-Bone Wong, yes, that's what he's credited under, feels like it was made deliberately wrong. Let's have a high school student sound like a 40-year-old soccer mom. Hey, you surprised me! Looks like you're back in action again, huh? <laughs> Yeah, I'm feeling much better. Let's have Juko Kubo's voice be layered with so much filter that it's basically incomprehensible. And you'd better leave the school, otherwise I can't promise you certainty. Let's have the voice actor for the main male love interest sound like this. I'm not trying to be arrogant. It's just that I haven't slept in a couple of nights. And I'm really not interested in jumping through your hoops. Oh, me? Hey, man. I'm not some trick pony that you see at the sideshow at the seashore. Cut me some slack, Pops, and let me go home. See me after class. Such energy. Never before have I seen such a performance since I was in 8th grade and had to listen to the class jog be forced to read a passage from the Chocolate War in English class. The Oscar race has truly begun. Leave me alone! Get out of my head! Come to think of it, the only person who sounds comfortable in their role is Alvaro J. Gonzalez as Rioi. We probably can credit this to him being one of the few actual voice actors in the cast, since he was the voice of Trent and Daria. Damn you! Evil beast return to darkness! Change name of Mystic Spiral to something something explosion. But even if they had gotten more voice actors from MTV animated series, it would not have helped because the mixing on this dub is shockingly poor. This might be the first for a show, but I really notice how bad the audio for this dub is. Character voices are mixed a little too loudly. I don't know. <laughs> what in God's name is that? Juka Kubo. Insert music will fade in and out in inopportune times. And best of all, Media Blasters might not have gotten the audio track for all the Foley, so every action set piece in this anime has all the force of a wet noodle. Like I said, deliberately wrong. But ooh, 
Lordy Lou, they couldn't just stop at bad direction or bad localization. No siree. The story it is trying to tell is rotten to the core as well. I am so glad I was able to find the stories that the main plot of the OVA based itself off of online. Part of Human Mirage at the beginning before transitioning to the strange story of the White Snake from that point forwards. And each of these stories are dumbed down, pale imitations of the source material. Human Mirage is the more faithful of the two. Having Hioi tell the ghost of a sickly middle school girl that she must move on to the next life does make for a good introduction to the supernaturalism of the anime. I don't care what you do, I'll be okay. I refuse to die. <gasps> Think about it. You can't win. I came to relieve your suffering. But it's an abridged version of the chapter that isn't allowed to breathe, so it is lacking in the pathos department. And it keeps the story element of girls mysteriously disappearing into thin air, which is not explained until a later story that wasn't adapted in this anime. So it feels like a drop plot point when it isn't mentioned ever again after the first couple of scenes. But it's worse for the main story because it doesn't even try to adapt the strange story of the White Snake. It instead tries to combine it with another Dark Hat story called Sad Pupils and use that to create its own shallow narrative. The two stories, one about a student being possessed by the spirit of a demon snake to take revenge on those who wronged him, and the other about a demon-possessed teacher who desires complete dominant control over her classroom, are combined into this bog-standard good-versus-evil narrative that also has decided to juggle explaining the origin and the rules of our two dark cats and their powers on top of it. Which is the reason why so much of this anime is just expository dialogue punctuated by fights. But it's almost useless to spend so much time explaining everything since Dark Hat breaks so many of the rules it establishes just to make for an easier story to tell. Halfway through the anime, the eldest Hioi gets wounded in a fight, and they spend so much time with this unnamed female Dark Hat healer explaining that his wounds need time to heal, and there's almost no telling when he'll be back in top form. Soon the spirits of the trees will heal you. Please, my dear brother, proceed with caution. This is the only time the anime seems interested in creating tension because the younger Ryoi is less experienced than his brother and might have to go the rest of this mission alone. Nah, never mind. Ryoi comes back no worse for wear just as things start getting hairy. Thanks Dark Cat, I was almost invested. And there's also the moment where the main human girl, Aimee, gets possessed by the demons despite the rule clearly stating that they only possess those with hidden evil in their hearts, and Aimee has shown to have nothing but pure intentions throughout this anime. So many negative feelings can build up inside. They can twist their soul, leave nothing but a ravaged and tortured spirit. Why did this happen exactly? Reasons. <laughs> Evil can find fertile ground in anybody's soul, even those like her who are pure of heart. It feels like Inoue's hands were tied when making this film, because as much restraint as this production has, it's clear as day that Nikatsu wanted to turn this Kolchak the Night Stalker with Catboys into Z-grade exploitation. So any subtlety or heavy themes that were present in the original manga are spirited away and replaced with a dumb love story. In the original, the love story was present between Aimi and her childhood friend Hiroki, but it's given some tragedy because Hiroki's found himself in a depression through bullying, stress from school, and getting rejected by a crush, and this allows him to become vulnerable to possession from a demonic snake, and is the reason why he's acting so weird and unresponsive to the bullying he receives. In the OVA, that whole plot point gets removed in exchange for Juko Kubo being the main big bad, and it results in Hiroki's weird attitude relegated to him just being mopey because he can't get over a love confession getting rejected. It makes him come off as selfish and dismissive, of Aimee's attempts to reach out to him because he's in full control of his actions now, which makes him super uncompelling, especially in the English dub. I'm never gonna have a real girlfriend. I'm gonna be by myself. And this changes the tragic ending of the story as well. In the manga, when Hiroki's demonic powers are fully unleashed, Aimee sacrifices herself to confess her love to Hiroki and ends up being the one to purify their souls and defeat the demon. In the OVA, it's Hiroki who must sacrifice himself because Aimee's the one possessed by the demons, which again makes no sense considering the established rules, and his love confession has no weight to it because we never saw him pine over Aimee like Aimee did to him. You had the story right in front of you, Inoue! Why make this change? Now finally, my love, we leave behind our dark past. Dark Cat is bad on its own, but knowing how this very same story was done in the source material makes it feel like this anime was sabotaged by its own staff. 
Most of the bad decisions going into this had to be calculated. You have to actually try to be this bad. I've seen actual cats hawk up better stuff than this anime. It really blows because it's just another example of a shoujo property being given shoddy treatment by the OVA era. Only this time, it was the studio trying to turn a manga into something it clearly wasn't. Female focused horror manga were big at the same time OVAs were big. Somewhere out there, there has to be at least one that rose to the occasion. One that wasn't constricted by budgetary limitations or an unsavory studio's demands. One that could just exist as it is. There's gotta be one out there. Isn't there? Maybe there is, my friends. Maybe there is.